Hi, family. Good morning. You know what's really cool is I get to uh, I get the opportunity, I get the uh, pleasure, the privilege, the honor to talk to you. And um, what I have prayed with almost all of you, and you become family. And in that family, it's just like sitting down. You know when you sit down at, at in the living room after supper, and you just talk. So let's talk. Um, who is, uh, uh, do we have any visitors here today? Hi, I'm Lyle. <laughs> How you doing? And uh, I'm not, you're, you're a visitor. Hi, Dana. Good to see you again. I have a question for you. Um, we get together as church because we believe in God. We believe there is a God. We believe, and so something in us just wants to get closer to him. How many ladies here have had babies? Come on, don't be shy. Have you had a baby? Put up your hand. Okay, you know that just before you give birth, you know, there's that that nesting thing that happens. You don't know what it is, but there's something going on, and you, you can feel it. You can't describe it, especially if it's your first baby. It's just like, you got energy. Something's going on. I know something's going on. I can't quite describe it. I can't put my finger on it, but something's happening. It's like that with all of us and God. We want to know him more, and there's this thing within us that wants to know him. You can't put your finger on it, you can't describe it, but it, it's like it, this push, this imper imperceptible pressure to get to know him. Um, I brought my other glasses, and they might fall off my head, and they're 1.5s where I usually use twos. So those of you who wear glasses, know what I'm talking about. Um, this talk is about prophecy and believing. We're going to try and meld some things um, that we've talked about before and uh, that we're going to be going into. So honestly, this was tough for me to do because um, I usually like to talk about things that are, I'm passionate about, that something God is doing with me in the moment, and I can just fire off something. Um, this, for me, was slogging. I didn't know even where to begin or what to do. So I did hours and hours and hours of research and getting scriptures down, and I put them down on a little four by uh, seven cards, and I have a stack of cards and scriptures, and I'm going through them, and they don't make any sense to me. Until God says, he showed me one that said, these things have been written that you would believe. Light bulb. All the things God does, all the things he says, all through history is that you would believe. Now we're going to jump around a little bit uh, here. Um, I was talking to Gary. I don't want to put him on the spot. He doesn't want to be put on the spot. But I can't yeah, do it anyways. <laughs> Thanks, Stacey. Oh, by the way, when Stacy prayed, she's on the front lines of firefighting. She is a mechanical engineer? or uh, yeah. yeah, mechanical engineer for the helicopters that fly back and forth. So she's exhausted. She controls five helicopters, seven helicopters. So she's intimately aware of everything that's going on, the life of the pilots, the, the, all, all the intricacies of the mechanics that go behind. So when you saw passion in her prayer, that was because she's right there. Um, my wife said, take a red pencil and mark down where I've been. Okay, so anybody, anywhere can answer this, and then I'm going to go to Gary after this. What are the attributes of God? Somebody. This is living room talk. What? Holy, okay. Okay, that's too broad. Let me, <laughs> don't mean to shoot you down. Give me one word. Almighty. Love. Justice. Shout it out. Somebody said... Keep going. Merciful. Yeah. Creative. Yeah. 
Yeah, keep going. You're going to hit it. Yes. 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 Keep going. Yes, omnipotent, omnipresent. There's another omni word. Omniscient. Okay, we have a bunch of words, and you've experienced. The reason you said these things to me, what God is, that's who God is to you. You've experienced him in that way, and so you can say, yes, God is merciful. I've experienced his mercy. I've been on my knees crying, and I felt his forgiveness. Awesome. You, you, you've been in a place where you go, God, please, what's the answer for this? You've got to answer it. And, he, and you feel his presence and you feel the wisdom of a revelation that comes to you and he blows your mind with how simple and how profound that is. Omniscient, omni, omnipresent, anywhere, anytime. He, he shows up and does what God does. In Isaiah chapter 46, I, I don't know if I should use, um, uh, do we have any pastors here? Any pastors? Yeah, I know. I'm just going to say, do I need to say verse, chapter and verse? Can I just blow through that? I, because that'll, okay. Kathy, for you. Okay, Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10. God says this, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I declare the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do my will. When he says this, the name above all names, there is no name above his name, he doesn't go to somebody and say, well, can I do this? Everyone comes to him and says, Lord, can we? Lord, is this your will? He's the name above all names. Omni powerful, all powerful. He is all powerful because he's omniscient. He knows all things. He knows the end from the beginning, all the permutations, all the possibilities, all the probabilities that will come. He's already there. And he speaks to us. How many people have had God speak to them? Don't be embarrassed. Michael, put up your everybody, just about everybody, if you're from here and you're looking backwards, you can see almost all the hands have come up. In Genesis, first line, in the beginning, the world was out form, without form and void. I'm going to pull most of my quotes from John because then I can just say chapter and verse from John. John says that Oh, I need to get my... This one verse I didn't put down. God is light. No, no, no. God said, let there be light. Here's going to be a mind blow for you. God is light in him. There is no darkness. And he said, let there be light. So we're putting Old Testament, Genesis, and we're putting New Testament together. John confirming the word. God said, let there be light. God is light. In him there is no darkness. God said, let there be me. Let there be me. Let the mercy, the grace, the creativity, the wisdom, the understanding, the, the, the all power, the keep keep going. He's the rescuer. If we get into Jesus stuff, we get into all those things that's Jesus. Let there be me. God wants us to know him. And in wanting to know him, there's certain things that have been happening all through history. He calls himself the Alpha and the Omega, the first word and the last word. He extends purpose in communicating everything he says. 
And for now, I'm gonna confine my thoughts to that because when the title of my talk is Prophecy and Believing, that's the entire Bible from front to back. And that I was completely overwhelmed in how God reveals himself through every action, every historical story, everything that's going on, every story that you, every personal experience. I am, uh, Gary, I'm going to call on you later. So just don't get nervous. Okay, Genesis 3.17, everything begins in the garden, everything starts there, and everything goes back to the garden. God said to Adam, because you have heeded the voice of your wife, see we're jumping straight into it, uh, I should give you some context. Um, Adam and Eve are in the garden, they're tooling around with God, they're naming the animals, they're having fun, um, it, yeah, and they're naked and unashamed, there's that part, that'll get you, now you're awake. Um, but all of a sudden, now we've talked about this before, uh, Satan shows up and he talks to Eve and says, has God indeed said? Because God's already talked to Adam and said, Adam, there's a couple trees in the garden and you can't uh, eat from those trees. Not yet. So that was Adam. So sometime later, we don't know, Satan shows up to Eve and says, has God d indeed said? Now, God didn't talk to Eve, he talked to Adam. Adam, the man of the family, didn't talk to his wife. Yeah, he, <laughs> communication difficulties. So Eve doesn't go, oh my, a talking snake. She listens. And then she sees that the apple, not the apple, she sees the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is good to eat. It looks good. Maybe I should taste it. And Satan's going, this is the, this is the cool thing, and you guys got to know this, and you've all experienced this, is that Satan, when he talks to you, it's like 95% truth and 5% poison. He'll, he'll take the truth and add a little bit of garbage to it so you would, you would be hooked. And that getting hooked into him would cause death. God said to Adam, because you have heeded the voice of your wife, now Adam's now eaten because Eve goes, oh, mm, that's good, here, you take a bite. He takes a bite and the rest of the story is God comes walking in the cool of the evening and says, Adam, where are you? And he says, well, I, I've hid, uh, you know, because we heard you talking. And we were naked. We were afraid. We were ashamed. You know, there's all these things. I'm, gonna, I'm paraphrasing, so don't shoot me down if I use some of my words. So things that were never in existence before came into existence. Shame, fear, control, hiding. Um, fear. God takes care of things. Now we're at this. God said to Adam, because you've heeded the voice of your wife and eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat. You can hear God saying other things in there. How many people, um, you read body language and that body language is more important to you than the spoken word. When somebody says something to you, you, you can go, you know, your BS detector goes. Boop, 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 boop. <laughs> well, God is saying something between the lines here. Because you have heeded the voice of your wife. It stands to reason that God also communicated you have not obeyed my voice. Now there's something that was never in there before, which is having a relationship with disobedience. If God speaks life into us and disobedience is the thing that separates us from life, he's mad because, not at them, but this thing has now come between us. Oh, no, no, leave it go. Leave it go. <laughs> no, she has to. 
As you read between the lines, it stands to reason that God also communicated, you have not heeded or obeyed my voice. Yet in all these statements, pregnant with meaning, underneath of all the sentiment is, you have not believed in or trusted in or relied on me. But you have believed the voice of your wife, and by extension, you have believed the one who introduced the lie. You submitted yourself to the lie, therefore you have submitted yourself to the liar. You have not obeyed, and that was rebellion, you have not obeyed my command, and according to Romans 6.16, now there's the Old Testament and New Testament put together, you have become a servant to sin. Romans 6.16, can somebody just pull that up quick? Anybody got a Bible, paper Bible? Let me hear that pages turn. Shout it out. Sword drill. Don't you know when you offered yourself to someone as a human slave, you were a slave to the one you obeyed, whether you were a slave to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness? Good. Because she and he, now uh, there's, there's dual culpability, they offered themselves to obey and then because they obeyed and they put Satan higher, everything that was with them, the dominion that God had given them, as I give you dominion over all the earth to take care of it and all the animals, that also came with them to be submitted to Satan's rulership. Now the liar has lied to them and a lot of times he says things like, you can't be forgiven. You can't get out of this. You're like this forever. You will never be healed. He, he speaks to that and all of a sudden you submit yourself to that in the way that you agree with that and submit yourself to that. To that same degree, you are now under that control. Um, the swords have gone back in their sheets. Um, here's one that God just spoke to me the other, way, the other day. Um, it'll be my paraphrase. Where you trespass into another kingdom, you come under the influence of that king. When Adam and Eve trespassed into the kingdom of unbelief, they placed themselves as slaves to the king of unbelief, and they subjected their dominion to that king. They disconnected from the source of life by transferring their connection to the new master. Like um, the old switchboard operators, they, they used to, remember Ruth Buzzy and one ringy dingy, two ringy dingies, three. I'm, if you're laughing, it's because you're old enough. Um, she used to pretend that she was an operator and she'd take the cord out and plug it into here and then she'd take the cord out and plug it into there. It was the same cord. And that's like us. We plug into, we're plugged into God and somehow we've made an agreement and we've disconnected from God and connected into the, the kingdom of lies. That's on us. That's on us. Jesus says, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, Kathy, if man cannot live on bread alone, sorry, man cannot live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, then disconnection from our source of life, the voice and the words and the presence of God set in motion something that never existed in the garden. That was death. Our walk with God in the cool of the evening has been usurped by a new master. It is the Father's will to return us to the original design that we would walk with God, that we would talk with God, that we would fellowship with him, that we just, you know, rub shoulders, laugh, you know, sitting in the living room talking. How you doing? How was your day? What's on your heart? Really, I, I see that you're kind of sad. Can you tell me what's, what's going on? You know, just that giving forth, back and forth with the Father. 
the original design that we would walk and share words and experience with him all the realities of eternal life. Here, when I say words, um, just for those people who are into this, um, the word in Strong's uh, 4487, write that down, Kathy, is rima, which is the spoken word. It is the immediate word. It is immediate word that has life on it. Logos is the entirety of the Bible, the, the entire thought, the mind of the Father, whereas Rama will be an immediate word. And when we, we experience words with the Father, he speaks to us immediate words that change our lives. Anybody here, well, I, I asked you before if you've heard from God, and a lot of you put your hand up. Okay, now, if you can do it in one minute or less, a synopsis of what did God say to you? How did it change your life? Anybody willing to go? Okay, we're going to start here. Okay, good. That's Ray. I think we're done. <laughs> so, did everybody hear that? Yeah. Ray, come back. <laughs> See, this is what I like about family. We just... Right, yeah. Okay. The first word that the Lord our God said to me uh, was at a point where I was actually walking across the trial breach and about to commit suicide. His words to me were choose life. That was the very first words that he had. And yeah. from, from that point began my relationship and the, the desire to know our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because nobody comes to the Father except through Christ. Amen. That cord that Lyle was talking about is the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And without that Holy Spirit and without knowing Christ, you can't form that relationship. That's less than one minute. <laughs> yes. Okay, did you catch the seriousness, the significance of that? Yeah. He was about to commit suicide and God talked to him. There's one back here. Okay, and then... then. There were, uh, sorry, uh, okay. Angela. Uh, he gave me a dream. It was really fairly simple. Uh, and just a quick backstory, uh, my father and I were disconnected over the, just because I had so much hurt and hate for him over a lifetime of experiencing emotional abuse. Um, and so in the dream, um, I had hugged him and I had apologized. I had said, um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking because I'm like, I guess like I'm s dissociating. Um, I'm sorry that I wasn't a better daughter to you. So it had shifted the blame from him to forgiveness, and also it opened a door, and I had told him that I wanted to say that in person, but it never happened, I had to say it over the phone. And he was like, what? <laughs> it stunned him, I said it again, and it's been different ever since. Yes, the that's so good. Words, the, 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 the I don't like, using the word magical, but the specific word that broke everything between us <laughs> that was bad. That's how our God works. There was one more, Mr. Wayne? Sure. Okay, Ray? Um, the first time God spoke to me was, I was probably about four years old, and uh, my mom started reading me the Bible, and she was pretty abusive, so it was kind of a rare thing that, you know, we get these kind of moments. So she started reading the Bible, and I remember looking at her reading the Bible, and it was kind of like when you get knocked out, but in reverse. Like, everything just went to light, and my whole body was gone, everything. Like, there was no, no feeling, just, just being. And wow. the light was vibrating at this kind of voice that kept on saying the word Jesus. Wow. And then uh, the, the voice actually started to say, everything's going to be okay. And then everything kind of faded back in. And that, yeah. 
has brought me through a lot of hard moments. <laughs> Give me five. That's awesome. Uh, there's Al right there. Um, probably Al, and maybe time for one more. Um, Gary, actually, if I could put you on the spot, you could do a, a short version, maybe how God talked to you. Um, Al? Uh, when I was a young man, um, it wasn't so much words. Um, there was a, a couple of um, clouds that showed up, and it was a blue, bright, sunny day. There were no clouds around, but these two clouds came over. And uh, one was the face of Jesus, and the other one was a cross. So I was pretty special in my brain here. And um, uh, some other words were, I will curse those who curse you and bless those who bless you. That's very cool. That's very cool. Everyone is, now you're starting to remember how God talked to you. Because this is a, a picturesque speak, speech in that God spoke audibly. God showed a dream. God showed in an act, something in nature. We're, we're now getting a textbook uh, explanation of how God t talks to us. There's more, but I'm, I'm sure it's going to come out. So it must have been 20, 25 years ago. I was at Dutch Harbor being baptized. It was a really blusterous spring day. The water was cold. And when I went in the water... I looked around and I saw a whole bunch of little fish, fishes everywhere. And I came up and there were ducks behind me and ducks flying over me. And I couldn't stop laughing because the Lord was telling me something, but I didn't know what it was. So as life went on, for the next 15, 20 years, I was working with the local groups doing fish restoration projects on the Slocan River. That's, that's very cool. Thank you. And one more for Mr. Gary here. Sorry, Gary. I'm going to come forward. Okay. Good. I'm going to go get my coffee while you're doing that. <laughs> I'm not one to get out in front of people, but I'm a, more of a person that goes one on one with someone. Anyway, I was talking to Lyle. By, by the way, my name is Gary Abel. Turned 80 this year. No way. Yeah. And uh, anyway, this happened. This testimony I was telling Lyle about I was just a young boy. And I was seven years old. I'd gone to the hospital to get my tonsils out. Now, this is back in Minidosa, Manitoba, in the middle of winter. And I got out of the hospital. I'm standing in a window looking out and I was feeling sick not very happy my parents had bought me gifts I wasn't interested in those I was looking out the window and I was praying and all of a sudden I felt the presence of the Lord standing right beside me I couldn't see him but I could feel how high he was how tall he was how wide he was and uh, so I started talking to the Lord and I said and um, I was telling him how sick I was and wasn't feeling very well. How old were you again? I was seven years old. Okay. <clears throat> now this, what I'm about to tell you is, it happened to me twice. The Lord comes with two or three witnesses to confirm anything that he tells you. And what I'm about to tell you came to me twice. <clears throat> anyway, I said, Lord, I said, uh, where is your gift to me? And I don't know why I said that. I, I think back now, I thought, boy, that's pretty presumptuous of, of me to even ask the Lord, where's your gift? But he said to me, my gift to you is that you'll never see death. Wow. Yeah. And I thought, wow. So fast forward, I was 11 years old. I'm not in the house at this time. I'm out in a field somewhere. I remember I was in a field. <clears throat> and the Lord appeared to me again. And he told me again that I would never see that. He told me some other things too, and I can't remember it all. But he told, that was something that was really important to me because I always kind of feared death as a, son, uh, as a, as a boy. <clears throat> Fast forward again to three and a half years ago. 
I was in my home. I live up in Christova, had an acreage up there. And uh, I got a two-story house. And I'm sitting, it was September the 7th, I remember. I'm sitting there on my sun deck. Uh, beautiful sunny day, I'm sitting in a chair. My Siamese cat's there lounging on the, on the deck. <clears throat> and I'm just enjoying the sun. And all of a sudden, I look around, and this is uh, just above my knees, about this high above my knees, was this transparent golden sheet of glass. Everywhere I looked had uh, tiny pinpoints of light all over it. And it, it sort of indicated to me those were people, languages, all the cultures of the world. This golden sheet of glass, and I thought, I looked around, I thought, what is happening? You know, I was sort of dumbfounded because I wasn't, I'd had visions in before in my life. I've had quite a few visions, but this one was pretty dramatic. It, and I could see through this, this sheet of glass. It, the glass was about, well, maybe about, oh, about an inch thick. But I could see through it, I could see the sun deck. So I'm looking, everywhere I looked, it was a sea of glass. Ironically, in, in, the, um, in the Bible, in Revelations, it talks about a sea of glass in the throne of God. Before the throne of God is a sea of glass, a golden sea of glass. <clears throat> and um, anyway, I, I'm, I'm looking at this sheet of glass, and all of a sudden, uh, the, the, this lasted for about a minute, and all of a sudden, this, sea, sea of, uh, this sheet of glass rose up into the air, but just above my eyesight, about this high. And I thought, what is going on? I'm looking through it now. It lasted for about 20 seconds, and then it just went whoosh, just gone, just like that, and there was a white cloud left behind. And backing up before I had this vision, two days before, I'd asked the Lord, I said, Lord, when's, that, when's the rapture going to happen? And then uh, two days later, he answered me with this, with, with this um, vision. And uh, so I sat there. I was dumbfounded for quite a while. But anyway, that's, that's what happened. And uh, I, I didn't want to get up in front. I told you. <laughs> anyway, I... Thank you. Yeah, I... Uh, Thank you, Gary. I'm here. And that lasted a little more than a minute, so I apologize. No problems, yeah. no problems. Uh, I want to... Uh, here, Ray, take that and turn that thing off. Um, so you heard a smattering. Everyone's got a story. Everyone's got from the audible voice, a supernatural occurrence, a dream, something that happened in vision. This is our God. He is prophetic. Everything, if I say a prophecy is a divine revelation of the divine mind. Oh, that's a big mouthful. He in the beginning said, let there be me, let there be light. He continues to reveal himself to us. Now, the one thing that will stop you from perceiving, understanding, holding on to, or grasping God is your own hardness of heart, your own unbelief. Your own unbelief that I can, I can only believe in what I see or feel or touch or measure. Uh, there was a guy from India, a guru, and, and uh, he was under the, the ideology that he would only believe in the things that he could see, feel, touch, or measure. And there was a, a, a guy coming in from the United States and asked him some question, and he said, I, I, I live in the United States, and the guru said, oh, I've never been there. I, I, I've never seen it, so I don't believe in it. And then the guy said, you have brains, don't you? Have you seen your brains? Have you held your brains? Have you measured your brains? Anyways, it's, it's part of that. I can only believe in the empirical belief that I can only believe in what I see, feel, hear, touch. You just heard people say there's something outside of what we can see, feel, hear, or touch. supernatural occurrences, something that speaks to your heart, transforms a life, transforms a life, transforms a life, transforms a life. 
When God speaks, he speaks words of life. John 6, 63 says, the words I, Jesus saying this, the words I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Every word coming from the mouth of the Father brings life. It, and if we go into uh, a couple pages ahead here, I should just slow down. Mm -hmm. I, I get excited. And this is totally different for me. You guys know that I usually go off the cuff and uh, reading is so different. Um, the new... Um, <laughs> are, did I do Revelations 19.10? Okay. Revelations 19.10, the end of the book says this. Worship God. For it is the spirit of prophecy who bears witness to Jesus. Amen. The New Living Testament says, For it is the essence of prophecy to give a clear witness for Jesus. And Weymouth's uh, New Testament says, Testimony to Jesus is the spirit which underlies all prophecy. All these prophetic events. Uh, what's your name? Paul. Paul. Okay. Paul. He said it with an accent. Paul. Paul. A Canadian out and about. No, no, that's English. Sorry. Um. Oh, yeah, you got to do this. Paul. Okay, I go Paul. The spirit of prophecy reveals Jesus. You've been fighting against, some people have fight against knowing Jesus. You, you fight. I'm not going to believe in that crap. I'm not going to. They're all a bunch of hypocrites. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to do this. But yet Jesus, that underlying thing, like the pregnant woman knows there's something going on. You can't put your finger on it. There's something going on. And the Spirit is directing you towards Jesus. God himself says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Listen to him. Hear what he has to say. He has the words of life. Jesus, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Sorry. Romans 10.10. 10. Sword drill. Go, Paul. Go, Paul. <laughs> Romans 10.10, 10, you got it? Five, four, three, Dan is the winner. Go ahead. Uh, for it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Did you catch that? Read it again, Dan. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Can you read that again, but really pronounce the word believing? Thank you. The title of this talk is Prophecy and Believing. In the Garden of Eden, Eve, I don't know how she did it, but she chose not to believe in God and chose to believe in Satan. She disconnected from God and she connected to Satan. She, she disconnected from belief and she connected into the kingdom of unbelief. When God speaks to Paul and Angela, Wayne, Gary, I'm um, sorry, I have forgotten your name, Jenny, in various ways, he does it so there would be transformation, so their hearts would be affected. Paul's still alive. Angela is transformed. Gary has hope beyond hope. 
Wayne knows there's something more than he can see, feel, hear, or touch. God is brilliant. He knows what you need, when you need it, and he speaks to you at that time. He's freaky good. Romans 10.10 says that with one, one who believes in their heart. So now it's this choice to disconnect, to connect back to the Father. Father, I choose to believe in you. I choose. You've given me signs. You've given me wonders. You've given me words of life. You've given me actions. You've given me encounters constantly. I'm there. I'm ready. I'm ready to believe. I'm ready to believe in you. Let me not get ahead. If prophecy is the divinely inspired word, the divinely inspired communication, let's try that again, the divinely inspired communication, then everything God says is prophetic. To reveal himself. Everything he says. If you go from cover to cover in the Bible, it'll take you a little while, but you're going to see God revealing himself, his justice, his mercy, his forgiveness, his plan for salvation, his son, the new heavens and the new earth. That. Okay, let me, don't get so far ahead, Lyle. Okay, I won't. All scripture. Kathy, 2 Timothy, verse, uh, no, chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Righteousness is that long 50 cent word that means right standing with God. Like, have you ever, um, have you ever, let's see if I can do this, PO'd your dad and all of a sudden you had to hang your head in shame because dad was mad with me. And it's like there's something between us. I can't look at him and he doesn't want to look at me. Nobody's shaking their head up and down. Maybe it was your mom. Maybe it was a coworker or a friend. Righteousness is that, that thing where all of a sudden there's right standing because there's some explanation between what happened, why I got angry, what happened, and all they go, oh, I still love you. I still love you. You're righteous because of what you believe, and you believe by reconnecting into the Father. If all Scripture is given by inspiration, then we can also read anything, anywhere in the Bible, and you're going to find the Father revealing himself that you would believe. Here we go. Now we're getting into the meat of the subject. Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. God who at various... Kathy. Okay. God who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets. He has in these last days spoken to us by his son, Jesus. You saw various times in various ways. Now he's speaking by Jesus. And Jesus says this. Old Testament says in Deuteronomy 18:18, 18, 18, the Father says, I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell him everything I command him. He's talking about the prophet that's going to be like Moses. You guys are with me because you read your Bibles and you're all up on this stuff. Jesus confirms this. Now I'm going to get into John. John chapter 12, verse 49, Jesus confirms, For I have not spoken on my authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and how I should say it. The Father is revealing himself through the words of Jesus. Jesus, by his own admission, is fulfilling the prophecy in Deuteronomy. And he is confirming that he only speaks what he sees the Father doing. And here's what the Father commands. Everything Jesus said is significant. He doesn't goof around, not even for one second. Everything he speaks is significant. Somebody say, why? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Um, his commandment is everlasting life. 
God says, I, I command everlasting life. In the garden, you disconnected from God. You disconnected from your source of life. So something that came into the garden that was never there before, not eternal life, but death now, it's hard for us to comprehend if you've been born into time because you see everything through the lens of time. But God, who is eternal, who calls the end from the beginning, the Alpha and the Omega, the first word, the creator of all things, who holds all things together by the word of his power, he is outside of times. He created time. He doesn't see through time. So, this is a hard concept. You might have to shake your head and get the cobwebs out. Because he's outside of time, everything has happened for him already. Again, like I said before, every combination, every permutation, every possibility has happened with him already. In your life. In your life. In your life. It's already happened. And so when he tells you something, Paul, when he tells you, choose life, it's because he's got something for you that's bigger than you can imagine. He's got a purpose for you, and your purpose is not done yet. There was somebody who had a near-death experience. Anybody here? Okay, somebody else. I'll move on to something else. His commandment is everlasting life. Life is in the word spoken by the mouth of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He speaks, choose life. Paul lives. He says, there's something more. Wayne, Wayne's heart comes alive. He speaks to Gary. And Gary says, you said to me, well, Gary, what was the first thing he said to you in your seven? You shall not die. Is that when you were seven, he specifically talked to you, you shall not die? Told never, see death. never see death. So Gary was, he, he needed to hear that because he was specifically dealing with the fear of death. In a seven-year-old child's mind, what does that look like? I don't know. God knew, and he knew Gary needed to hear those words. Yeah, I asked him, yes. That was a gift. And there was your gift. Awesome. The gift of Comfort, exhortation, talking with the Father. There's so many gifts in there. Here we go. John 3.16, you guys have all heard it? And 17, that's a good one. Some people are wearing it. It's on their keychains. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever in him should not perish but have everlasting life for god did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved he who in him is not condemned but he does but he who does not is condemned already because he has not in the name of his only begotten son so now you're you're catching it it's belief Belief disconnects you from Satan and reconnects you to the Father, and it's by your choice. In the same way there was a choice in the garden, there's two trees, there's always a choice. If there was no choice, we would not have free will. If there was no choice, we would be automatons. So we have a, a choice to connect to the Father, and this is going to bug somebody, some people here, because you're not going to be able to sleep, because he's saying, I, I told you, there's a choice. Isn't God good? that he bugs you until you, you make that choice? Sometimes it's that put pressure to make that choice because he loves you that much that he doesn't want you to die, but he wants you to live. And that is so cool. Amen. John 1.12, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who? In his name. Now you're getting it, belief. Okay, the woman at the well. I'm going to tell some stories, and the stories will illustrate um, 
is exemplify, exemplify. Yes, that word. Um, the things I'm talking about, belief. So the woman at the well, you guys know that story? You've heard that story a hundred times. The woman at the well, she comes late in the day because we're in John chapter four. Here's how you remember. John chapter four. I've had four and one more. John chapter four, because the woman had five husbands. Oh, guys, stay with me here. <laughs> um, so the woman comes to the well in the middle of the day, which is unnatural for a woman to come at that time. She comes by herself without an escort. She comes without the other women. She's ostracized. She's had five husbands. Jesus is waiting for her. Okay, that's the context. She's getting well. She's hot and sweaty and drawing water from the middle of the day. Jesus asks her for a drink. There's a bunch of stuff that goes on back and forth. There's bantering back and forth until finally Jesus prophesies, for you've had five husbands and the one whom you now have is not your husband. Because Jesus asked her a question. He says, Who, where's your husband? Who's your husband? She says, I don't have a husband. And he says, yeah, you spoke rightly. You don't have a husband. You've had five husbands, but the guy that you're with, oh, so my memnotic device doesn't work. Five and one more? Okay, guys, um, I will just work my way through this. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. No, no, I need someone to laugh once in a while, but that's okay. Don't encourage me. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, actually, thank you very much, but that's good. Um, the woman has a light bulb moment. This is the point I'm getting to. The woman has a light bulb moment. She says, sir, I perceive you. You are a prophet. How many of you would say, oh, that's really weird. He knows stuff. I perceive you are a prophet, and all of a sudden, in the context, uh, they go, wow, he's a prophet. He knows things. He, he, he hears from God. Oh, this is for us. Um, uh, the, the, the more mature in the, in the crowd, I don't mean age-wise. In Corinthians 14, Paul talks about the gifts of the Spirit, and he says... So Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1 says something like, um, pursue earnestly uh, to prophesy. Like desire it. Have a healthy, it's like jealousy. I, I want to prophesy. Why? Paul says this. This is just a little segue. I'll come back. Paul says this, if somebody comes in who's uninitiated, who hasn't had experience with God, who, who's just seeking after God, and, and he walks in and you all prophesy and you expose the secrets of his heart, he is convicted of all, by all. And he says, God is surely in this place. Prophecy is a door opener. So one of the things that you guys can do, um, Paul says you can all prophesy one by one. You don't believe it. Ouch. Paul says you can all prophesy one by one. When you believe it, you will be positioned that you can bring life to somebody. You've seen it all have happen often. Let's say... Um, sometimes I'm out by the coffee uh, place like there, and I'm standing next to somebody, and all of a sudden, I'll hear something for them. And, and you'll hear something, and you go, this is just the weirdest thing. I'm going to give you a little quick story. I was working with a guy. I'm a floor layer. I'm a guy who's on his knees, laying floor, putting glue down, putting flooring down. And there's a guy helping me. Now he's off the street. I don't know what to talk to him about. He's just pulled in for labor help. And I hear God say, ask him if he's ever had sleep paralysis. <laughs> That's a pretty specific word. 
I, I go, dude, I, I got a question for you. you. This is really strange. Can I ask you? He goes, yeah, sure. Go ahead, shoot. I said, have you ever experienced sleep paralysis? He goes, oh, man. He goes, I have been experiencing sleep paralysis. And, Bless you. Get, get it out like the cat. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he experienced sleep paralysis and I said, so when did this start? And he said, oh, I started dating a witch. Oh, so there's somebody into witchcraft and all of a sudden two become one flesh, the things that are, have access to her now have access to him and he's experiencing spiritual attacks of sleep paralysis. Cool. I, and then I said to him, give me your hand. So I shake hands with him, and uh, I said, just say this, Jesus, do you love me? And he said, Jesus, do you love me? And then he goes like this, the presence of God comes, and he goes, dude, you're freaking me out. You're freaking me out. I said, what's going on? He goes, I'm all electric. I said, well, that's the presence of God. I said, just to say this, Jesus, if this is you, double it. He does. He does. And he's now, he's got tears running down his eyes and he keeps saying, dude, you're freaking me out. You're freaking me out. The prophetic word, God wanted to speak to him at that moment for something that was going on in his life. There was more of the conversation, but this illustrates that one, when you know that you can prophesy one by one, that somebody would come to life. That somebody would meet something that they haven't thought about before. Even though it is one of the most uncomfortable things you can do when you're first starting out because you don't know if you're hearing from God, you don't know if it's you, you don't know if it's something you ate, you don't know if it's the commercial. But after a while, after practicing, that's what's so lovely about being family, is after practicing for a while, you get to know the, the voice of the Father. And once you get to know the voice of the Father, you have such confidence that the Father has something to say to so-and-so. It becomes normal Christian life. And so there was uh, uh, Leonard and Sophia. Do you remember Sophia was... No, I won't tell that story. Sophia... No, I won't tell that story. <laughs> she heard for somebody and somebody got saved, uh, which is really cool. Um, just this past, now it's two weeks ago, uh, a guy who was one of my friends in Ontario um, called me. Um, he's living now in Alberta. He says, my brother has cancer. Can you uh, pray for him? He's got pancreatic cancer. And he's only got a little while to live. And I said, sure, I'll pray for him. So we got on a, a, a conference call and we prayed. Awesome. I said, can I can I call you again? The guy, the guy with cancer says, sure. I'll, I'll, uh, I would love for you to get together with me again. So a couple days later, the guy who lives in Alberta flies to Ontario and uh, he texts me. He says, I'm here now. Let's, let's pray again. And so it's early where I am. And I say, sure. We get on the phone. And while I'm dialing, I said, God, I got nothing. I got nothing. You, you're going to have to carry this conversation because I don't know what to say. I don't know where to go with this. And the guy on the other end of the line says, you know, hi, Lyle, how you doing? That's good. And we chit-chat for a bit. And I said, what's on your heart? And he goes, how do I know if I'm accepted by God? How do I know if you're forgiven? God set the tone. God, through his spirit, gave him that little push, and he said those words. How do I know if I'm accepted? How do I know if I'm, I'm forgiven? Well, we, we prayed through things, asked for forgiveness. He accepted Jesus. He went to his family and told them he accepted Christ. He, everything has changed. Um, his, his brother has now told me that. He said that was a heavy, and that was one of the biggest things that's ever happened in his life. That becomes normal Christian life when you know that you hear from God. 
getting from starting to hear from God to I'm sure I'm hearing from God is a process. And you know what? You're going to make mistakes. You are going to make mistakes because you're going to put you in the way of it. This is the biggest impediment to hearing God's voice is you. You will interpret it through your past, through your traumas, through your belief systems. And, and that'll take some time. And God goes, yeah, she's working through it. He's working through it. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. You'll have other people that are more mature that can come around you. And you can hear what, they can hear what you're saying. Because initially when this starts to happen, you get next to somebody and say, this is what I'm getting. This is what I'm hearing. Does it make sense to you? Seriously, check it out. And then that process becomes solidified and you're sure that God is speaking. You can then ask somebody, hey, have you ever had sleep paralysis? I'm so sure that God is speaking to me about things that I'll say things that are really bold um, and uh, quite startling. And um, a lot of times when you speak the things that God is speaking, the door opener, the prophetic to the heart, all of a sudden the person will be standing there in front of you and they'll just start to cry. They're just like big old tears will come down because the words of life have, have affected their heart. How much time do I have? Because I've just barely started. Are you, you guys okay with this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Except through me, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so in other words, you have to introduce Christ into this, yeah. into our relationship to Christ, and with that, the kind of the connection to the Holy Spirit is kind of, what you're saying is true, yeah. but the, the fact is kind of, it, it's important to explain that, that nobody comes. Yeah, I agree, that's, that's Jesus' words, nobody comes to the Father except by me. If you know that when initially everything God says is prophetic, that he would reveal himself. Is that me? It's not happening. No, no, it's okay. I just thought maybe I was doing something. Um, nobody comes to the Father except by me. If the Father is revealing the mind of God, and he is so holy that we cannot comprehend, come into his presence, except through the word. Jesus is the word. This is a concept. Concept is God is so holy. God is the thought, the precursor to everything, the creator. He's the thought. He, he communicates through a word. The word is not the thought. The thought is not the word yet they are one. You cannot communicate something through a word unless the thought behind it is encapsulated in that word. Are you with me? You cannot explain the Father without the word. Jesus is the word. He says, no one comes to the Father except through me. The words I speak to you are spirit and they are life. That you would choose to believe. Okay. We're just at the woman at the well. And we were, we're at Paul. Paul, you can all prophesy. The woman at the well, at the well loses it. She says, I perceive you're a prophet. And he tells her, you've had five husbands. And she goes, she drops her, whatever water bucket she's got. She's leaving her water bucket. She's leaving the old way she was. She's leaving the life as she knows it. And she runs into town. And she tells the men of town, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Her heart opened up. And she, this has got to stop or else it's going to be, hold on here. What is that? 
Maybe, Ray, give me that microphone just in case, because I don't know what's going on. I'm trying to. You turn this off. Bear with me for a second. I got it off there. Um, just that the uh, woman at the well, she leaves everything as she knows it. It's, it's very um, a, a good illustration. She drops what she does and she runs. And she goes back into town and says, come see a man. Now they come out to see Jesus. And the end of the story, after the, he stayed there for another couple days because they begged, stay, stay with us, because he has the words of life. The end of the story is that many Samaritans of the city believed in him because of the word the woman who testified had told. Fully well, convinced that Jesus had the words of life, that the prophecy was true, so the man must be true. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay, and he stayed. And many more believed, not because of, and many more believed because of Jesus' own word. Then in verse 42, because we're now, uh, we're, we're in uh, verse 42 of chapter 4 of John, they said to the woman, now we believe not because of what you have said, for we ourselves have heard him. And we know, we've experienced, we've comprehended, we believe that he is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Your testimony is important. Some of you testified. Some, you know, the ones who's, who stood up right now, all of you have stories. All of you have stories, and you think they're insignificant because, well, I, I, I didn't die and come back to life, and I, I didn't have a visitation with an angel. Uh, uh, uh Your story is significant. It has weight. It has power. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. It has a couple ways of, of seeing that, but your testimony is important. You have something where you've experience the Father. You can tell somebody else, I've experienced the Father in this way. And their hearts will open. The prophetic word, your testimony becomes prophetic to reveal the Father. Everyone say, I have something important to say. You all have something important to say. You just need to believe it. I, you know what? I've got two other stories, but I, I think... Um, you give me a few more minutes to end. I can see the landing strip from here. But this may take a little while. But I see the runway. I'm going to land. This, this story of the woman of the well is a New Testament prophecy in action. Somebody heard the word of God. Somebody's heart opened. And somebody believed. And then it multiplied. And a whole town went to believe. It was really simple. They didn't go to school for five years and learn what to do. He didn't have to read 25 deep theological books. My burden is light. The yoke is easy. Tell your story when you can. Don't look to do it because then it's you pushing it. But when the opportunity arises, be ready to just share. When you share your heart, you're going to connect heart to heart with somebody else. And their hearts will be impacted and God will be revealed. Amen? Amen. And we're going to... Um, there's, a, there's a story of the man born blind very, very quickly. Um, we're all born blind to the reality of 
of God, of Christ. And heals the man, born blind. And there's the story of Lazarus, who is dead, who is a, the picturesque speech that the man dead in sin. Um, he wasn't in sin, but he's dead. Um, Jesus is talking with his disciples back and forth. And uh, they know Lazarus is sick. They said, well, we should go see him. Jesus said, just, you know, we're going to wait here for a couple more days. And they said, well, if he's sick, we should go. We could heal him. Jesus says, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad I wasn't there. What does it say? What's the rest of that? That you would believe. Yeah, well, thanks, because that's Martha, Martha talking to Jesus after she says, uh, or, or was it Mary? It's one of the M&Ms. That uh, she said, oh, Jesus, if you had been there, uh, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus says, this is so the works of God can be shown. This wor- that He's not dead, but uh, this sickness is unto death. And so now, talk to Martha, and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall not die, but have everlasting life. Everyone do a one of these. He goes to the grave site. He weeps. He says, Father, I, I know you hear me always. Thanks that you're here. But I'm saying this so that these people here will believe. Now, I didn't write that down, did I? Did I get that right? Jesus raises him from the dead. It it shows that uh, everything he does, that prophetic act, that he can raise somebody from the dead. He can heal somebody. He can set somebody free. He can deliver somebody. He can speak words of comfort and life, exhortation. He reveals the Father, who is all of those things. We started out with, what are the attributes of God? He's dead for four days. By now, he stinks. John thirteen nineteen. Yeah, there it is. I said this for their benefit, that they may believe you sent me. Um, it's simple. There it is, the prophetic act, so they would believe. Now you're getting uh, um, a rounder picture of the concept. The, pro- the prophetic doesn't exist to um, build up the person prophesying. It's, it's a gift. It's not, it's not to say, oh, he's prophetic. It's not for that at all. It's that somebody else would live. It's that somebody else would get a hold of Jesus. Somebody else would meet in a supernatural way, a word of life, something. Somebody else would meet the Father. You with me? Okay, John 13, 19. Now I tell you before it comes to pass that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. 14, 29. And now I have told you before it happens, so then when it does happen, you will believe. <sighs> Chapter 22, verse 42. He who believes in me believes not in me, but the one who sent me. There's the reconnection. You believe in Jesus. Through Jesus, you reconnect with the Father. 
And this is the point of the whole thing. When you believe in God, you can connect to God. And as a works-based people, we all want to do something. God, I want to know you more. What do I have to do? Do I have to crawl around on my knees and do penance? Do I have to, what do I have, what do you want me to do? You're really close. Well, my answer is different. This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Those are Jesus' words. Unless you have a rough time with the things that Jesus spoke, because he only spoke with, he heard the Father say and what he was commanded and how to say it, that the Father would be revealed. These are the works that you would believe. In John 17, the final prayer, John chapter 17. So now it's just before the, uh, it's during the Last Supper, and just before he goes to get crucified. Father, I have given them the words which you have given to me, and they have received them. They have received the words of life. They have received the words of hope. They have the, received the words of correction. They have received the words of, of eternal life. And they have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. This is going to be a kicker. This is, I think this is a closer. Yep, last page. Runway's coming. Finally, in John uh, chapter 14. Jesus says, I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. Nothing that he can claim as his own. No unbelief, no lie, no shame, no fear. Nothing that comes from the king of lies. This is full circle. It's a return back to life the way it's supposed to be, walking with God in relationship as it was in the garden. It's full circle where we started walking with God, talking with God, just chilling, just in the living room, kicking back, talking about what's on our hearts. He has done everything. He gave his son. He gave his best. He has done everything, and it happened 2,000 years ago. I don't know. Something like that. He has done everything that we would believe. That was said with so much enthusiasm. He has done everything that we would believe. Yes. Okay. Um, Everyone here, you have at some time experienced God. I don't know about the, uh, I I don't know you, sir, but uh, something got you to seek out more of God. To actually I'm going to sit down in church to hear maybe what God has to say. This is very much proof that he's working in your life. Awesome. He's working in my life. So cool. There's this, this is extremely uh, deep because it, it goes places that um, in belief into uh, things that you're not ready yet to hear. But you start the journey. You start by reconnecting into the Father. And he says, instead of Adam, he says, Ken, where are you? Ken goes, right here, Dad. He goes, yeah, I see you. Hey, have you had a good day? He says, Stacy, where are you? He goes, right here, Dad. He goes, good to see you. How about that son of mine? Do you like him? Isn't he wonderful? <laughs> yeah. He says, I like him too. I ain't coming down the runway. Do you want more of Jesus? An analogy. Close your eyes. This is just an imagination. It's not anything else. If you see, uh, Jesus said, the kingdom of God is like a pearl. If you see a pearl, a huge pearl, say eight feet tall, 
And it's absolutely astounding at how big it is. You can't lift it. All you can say is this is such valuable treasure. And you scratch the surface of it and the light comes out of it. You can't see all the light, but it's blinding in his presence. The kingdom of God is like a pearl. There's so much there. This, what I just talked about, is just scratching the surface of the kingdom of God. There is so much more. It gets so exciting. How many people here have a computer? You liars. Put your, oh, everybody put your hand up. <laughs> It, you'll have access to something. If you have a computer or a telephone, anything like that, and you get in on the internet, you can access everything in that internet if you have the know-how. Like the pearl, and we've scratched the surface and the light's coming out. It's not all the light, but you have access by looking into it to see all that the Father is. You believe in Jesus. You've connected to the Father. And in some aspects, some small way, you understand the Father. You feel his love. You, you, you want more. But there's so much more. And there's so much more he has for you. So much more life. Are you willing to receive that life? Okay, nobody here is. Um, let me go over here. Are you willing to receive that life? Okay, stand up with me, please. <sighs> Father, we are so willing to receive that what you said. I have come that they would life and life in abundance. I, would, I have come that they would have more. Father, we ask for, I ask for more of you. Would you reveal yourself more? Would you blow my socks off with how good you are? Would you mess me up with the way you think? Would you touch my heart that my heart would be made new? That my mind would be transformed? That your Holy Spirit would come and, and start speaking through me so I could prophesy? Lord, don't, me, don't let me be stupid. I tend to be stupid and say things I shouldn't. Let me speak what you speak. You said in your word, as many as believed on him, he gave the right to become children of God. Let me speak as your child who speaks what the Father says. God, I am so willing. Would you set something up this week? that you would give me that nudge, that I could speak to somebody and a door would be opened, their heart would be affected, that you would be revealed. Amen? As always, if you have questions or something, there are people over here. Gary's already set up to pray. If I could have the worship team back up here, we'll worship again. Um, did you learn something today? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We've landed.